Ladies and gentlemen, wrestling fans, friends, thank you for joining us right here once again this week on the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. My name is JJ Purdom, and alongside me, my broadcast colleague, he is the man, the myth, the legend, Scott Falder. What's happening, Scott? JJ, you know what? This is normally the time that I take the time to say just how awesome you are and blow smoke up your rear end, but there is so much happening in the wrestling world this week that we don't have time to listen to me basically puff you up. So I'm saying let's get into the action right away. Well, I'll tell you what, I like being puffed up. It's one of my favorite things, but of course, I'm married, so I don't get that puffed up thing very often. So we've got a lot of wrestling action we're going to talk about this week because we are a wrestling show. You don't want to hear about Scott and I talking about old guy problems like my hemorrhoids or or his hip issues. We're going to talk pro wrestling because that's what we love and that's what you love. And that's obviously why you're listening to the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. This week, one of the first things that jump off the page to me with all of the things that are happening is Road Dog Jesse James. Oh, you didn't know he is back in WWE in an executive role. He was released not that long ago, Scott, uh, with all the budget cuts. And of course, when Triple H had had all the issues with the heart deal, uh, his whole team started becoming dissected and removed from power. And of course, William Regal ended up going on to join AEW, and he's been very successful with the the Blackpool Combat Club, but Road Dogg has been on the periphery and he was at one point the head writer for SmackDown, went down to NXT, was teaching uh, promo classes. Of course, he, amazing, comes from the Armstrong family, Bullet Bob and all of his brothers, Scott, Steve, Brad, of course, the wrestling juggernaut that he was. Well, Brian's back and he's back in an executive role. He's taking over live events. And I'm just going to go ahead and before before you talk about it, we'll combine this with another article that came out. Jeff Jarrett has been removed, has left the company in that position that he took only three months ago as that executive of live events. What, what do you take is happening over at WWE? Obviously, lots of changes, Scott. But Jeff Jarrett out, Road Dog right in. This This blew my mind. This was not anything I was expecting. I believed that Road Dog was going to end up going to AEW and partner up with his old buddy Billy Gunn, badass Billy Gunn, and do a little reunion tour with the two because badass still looks badass. <laughs> so, <Yeah, he> does. <laughs> but no, I figured they would partner up, and Road Dog is tremendously good behind the scenes when he was producing, when he was writing. You know, everything about him, he is a true professional in the business. So having having Triple H hire him back was a great move for Triple H. And you can yeah, obviously you- tell he's he's creating his own team. And JJ, you have something you wanted to mention there, but I keep talking. Well, no, it's great. No, keep doing that. That's great. No, I, I was just going to add, like, you're totally right. Um, he is assembling a team. And it's, it's like he's putting these pieces in place and i think that i think chris jericho mentioned recently um that you know with vince leaving there is going to be so much change taking place in wwe but those everlasting changes that you're looking for and that i'm looking for even though he's putting into place all these pieces on the chessboard you know moving people where he wants them uh in relation to how he'd like the structure of creative to run um it's going to take a while. We might not see a lot of those changes come to fruition for a year, 18 months, 24 months. I mean, in, in 18 months, the entire landscape of WWE and NXT and the NIL program and how they do developmental as well as what's presented on television can look entirely different. I mean, we're seeing it each and every week, Scott, as the, the wrestling has gotten better the, the matches are getting longer. We're seeing more long form storytelling, which I think ultimately Triple H, in my opinion, has been doing a great job. And I know like a lot of us loves Triple H, but I think that really, if you break it down, he is making it to where wrestling fans who are diehards like you and like me and like the people who are listening to this show right now are 
very happy with the direction of the show right now with more wrestling, less backstage stuff, things that have better cohesion. They make sense. They're logical. Uh, they're not just things being thrown out there. The, the whole idea that they bring Road Dog back, 100% behind it. I am for it. But then to get rid of Jeff Jarrett after just three months in the position, what the heck? Was Jeff Jarrett not a Triple H guy? Was Jeff Jarrett more of a Vince guy, even knowing their history from years ago? That is something that we still don't know. At least I don't know. And I have I have placed phone call after phone call. And I'm not getting any answers from people who seem to, to know. They just know that they're happy that Road Dog is back. And, you know, you're talking about the production values. WWE has always had tremendous production values. But now they are putting a new emphasis on wrestling. And we're talking great wrestling. We're not talking about the, the slapstick, doink the clown type wrestling. We're talking wrestling for wrestling's sake. The storylines are starting to gel and make sense. And, and, and I attribute that to Triple H's vision. And Scott, you know, how dare you badmouth the good damn name of Doink the Clown? Well, you when know, Matt, <laughs> Matt Bourne. Matt Bourne, <laughs> Matt Bourne was amazing. <laughs> he was. When he was Matt Bourne, he was amazing. As Doink the Clown, he was a bit clownish for me. But, but no, I am enjoying the WWE product more than I have in probably a decade. Just it has it's tight. They they have just brought it into the 21st century. And and this is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of AEW. It's for the wrestling. And now WWE is getting back into the wrestling. I enjoy the storylines to go with the wrestling, but I was not a big fan of WWE when they had a two-hour SmackDown show and 12 minutes of wrestling. That, to me, was wrong. It was upside down. Triple H yeah. is bringing that back. Yeah, I'm glad to I'm glad to see it. Yeah, it does need to be an entertaining show, and it needs to be presented in a way where you're going to catch more than just the diehard fan. Uh, you're going to catch those people who are going through and looking for something, but a lot of those people want to see action, and that's one of the things that WWE superstars are able to do so well on a routine basis. Yet the the bad acting and the silly skits. There's a place for some of that stuff. There's a place for some comedy. You do wrestling is a variety show, Scott. I think Brian James uh, or Brian Armstrong, uh, Road Dog, is going to do a great job coming back in and being involved in the live event stuff. He knows about live events. He comes from a heritage of good people in the wrestling business, the Armstrong family that have been doing these things for years. Uh, I am curious what happened with Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett for all intents and purposes, was doing a really good job. Of course, we just saw him at the last match in that tag team main event with Ric Flair and Ric Flair's last match recently uh, while he's under contract to WWE because he had agreed to do that, that match before. And, of course, WWE has always been good about finish your commitments, finish your, your outside commitments before you fully commit here. And they're, they were really good about that. And... For what I'm hearing, he was doing a great job. So it, there's no telling if WWE just wanted to go in a different direction, uh, what the idea is, uh, if he was a Vince guy. Is this Triple H removing some of those guys that are quote-unquote Vince guys, that are like Vince core team? There's There's been talk about others. You know, where are they landing in the landscape that is a new Triple H-led creative WWE? Uh, Bruce Pritchard has been a, a huge uh, right hand to Vince McMahon for decades. Uh, he was gone from the company, obviously, for a while, got fired numerous times, what Vince would call a hiatus uh, numerous times, was brought back in an executive vice president role where he was producing Raw and SmackDown. He was kind of the head guy overarching both of those shows. And is he having anything to do with, with creative at the moment? I'm not really sure. It's kind of up in the air. Like, what is what is Bruce doing right now at the moment? Of course, we all know that he's good friends with Conrad Thompson, and they've got a, a highly successful podcast with something to wrestle with. I love it. I listen to it religiously whenever he's there, because obviously his duties at WWE 
have become so much that he's been missing a whole lot of episodes as of late. And I thought it was a cool move on WWE's part to allow him to maintain the podcast because it is so entertaining and there's a, a huge fan base for it that have just fallen in love with the, the, with the two of them. Is Bruce pretty close to being able to have a lot more free time in the in the soon to near future, Scott, that he's going to be uh, on the on the unemployment line from WWE with Triple H in charge? What do you think? Bruce Pritchard has been there for as long as I've been alive, and he has always been a Vince guy. I Bruce Pritchard bleeds WWE blood. Getting rid of him. Would could be a bad move just because everyone knows Bruce. He has more contacts probably than anyone else out there except good old JR. And but yet at the same time, Hunter is turning this company into his and Stephanie's company. It's one of those deals where when the family gets together for dinner on a let's say a Sunday evening and Vince is sitting at the head of the table. Do they argue who sits at the head of the table now? Is is Hunter saying, <laughs> Vince, get out of my chair. I never thought of that, Scott. <laughs> and is Vince saying, Hunter, it's my company. And Hunter basically <laughs> gives him the pedigree on the table. I, I would love to be a little fly on the wall when they get together because, as you know, Vince lives and breathes that company. That's his baby. He changes its diapers. He fixes its little boo-boos and owies. And now he has to sit back and let somebody else take care of his baby. Not it's an easy thing position. to do. Oh, my yes. God. Okay. Got to be a diff difficult position. If you're Vince McMahon and, you know, you have your grandfather, your father, and then you uh, with this company, and then you cultivate it into the, the mega company, the, the multi-billion dollar company that it is now. And you just have to kind of walk away and kind of wash your hands of, of really having your fingers in it because you, you made choices. And that's really what it comes down to. Vince made personal choices or allegedly, um, which led to him eventually walking away. None of us thought Vince McMahon would ever walk away from WWE. Keep in mind, he still has a vested interest in it being successful. Uh, and he's got a lot of friends and family there, but he's also, the bottom line is, he owns the majority of the Class A stock. So he still profits when WWE does well. What does Vince do now with all of this free time on his hands? I mean, he could just be vacationing and, you know, putting his feet up and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like Vince is never going to be happy without having that motor behind him, without running. Obviously, he doesn't have access to the uh, the private plane anymore, Scott. So Or the talent. That. <laughs> Absolutely. So what does he go back into some type of wrestling I don't see that. I don't think, why would you ever want to try to do that with your personal, I mean, you've already done that. He did try the XFL thing. Uh, the second time around, it seemed like it was actually doing fairly well. I'm not a football fan, but it seemed to be doing fairly well. And then just, it happened at the wrong time. Oh. The COVID happened and it just kind of killed it. And uh, of course, Rock took it over. So if you're Vince McMahon, are you going to go and gamble like that again? with all this money that you have at your disposal? Or are you going to be sitting on a beach drinking Mai Tais and, uh, you know, stop working out? I don't think Vince has it in him to sit on a beach and drink Mai Tais and stop working out. Vince is a driven personality. When you talk about type A personalities, Vince is a capital quadruple type A personality. I mean, who else gets up at three in the morning to work out when you're in their 70s? No one, no one. <laughs> no, no, they, no, they really don't. Uh, I just saw actually, well, there is one other guy that's in his seventies that at 76, that looks similar to Vince. So he's a year younger than Vince, but he actually looks in better shape than Vince. It's Sylvester Stallone. Now, I don't know if you've seen pictures of Sylvester Stallone recently, but the guy is still jacked. He's, you know, his arms look huge. His shoulders look huge. He obviously loves to work out and Vince is the same way. It's one of those guys that, just pushes themselves and they push others around them to, to stay at that level. And with Vince not having a, a direction to go, I do worry about him. If he doesn't have, you know, a goal in mind, what's the point? So I think that he'll probably stay quiet for a little bit. And then we may very well may see him 
get into something else, whether it's buying a football team, which that was something that he talked about at one point was buying an NFL team. There might be a little too much heat on him right now at the moment, but it's within his reasons and within his financial means to go and and buy a football team and try to lead them to the NFL's, you know, Super Bowl or whatever. I mean, could you see Vince doing that? It's something he has talked about and and desired for in the past. Well, you know, with Vince, anything is possible. But, you know, I'm glad that you brought up Sylvester Stallone because this week's episode is sponsored by the movie Samaritan, which is Sly Stallone's new movie coming out on Amazon Friday August 26, he plays a former retired superhero that he no one knows that he is the superhero. And um, let's see, what were we supposed to say about this sponsorship? Great movie, uh, Amazon, October, or August 26, Sly Stallone, 76 years old, great shape. Um, no, kidding. They are not sponsoring <laughs> us. But no, the movie is coming out on Friday the 26th on Amazon. And I actually am looking forward to it because... I am you know, he, like, he looks it looks great. like one of those fun, fun movies that like looks like a lot of fun. Like for a second, I thought like, man, Scott, Scott did it. He got us like a sponsor. Awesome. No, uh, it does look like a lot, like a lot of fun. But, now, but maybe that's what Vince does next. Maybe he starts, you know, uh, going into action films and, well, here, you know, here, doing the old guy thing. You know, here's the crazy thing. Sly Stallone, in, when he was promoting the movie Samaritan, he actually said that he based all of his movies all the way back to Rocky on professional wrestling, the good guy versus the bad guy. And, you know, the heel, the the face, everything about his movies is always good guy, bad guy. And he's credited all, all of it to professional wrestling. That's how big wrestling is in our world. Yeah. And little known fact that you and I have not talked about before, Rocky, the original Rocky is my favorite movie of all time. And I, I just love the movie. I've seen it so many times. I love all of them, but the reason that I love it is it has the same dynamic of what I grew up loving in pro wrestling is the, the story of good versus evil and those dramatic storylines and coming up from adversity and, uh, you know, the, the pain of defeat and all of that, like every, every aspect of those emotions come from those movies and stuff like that. So maybe that's what we see next time on Amazon prime, or on, you know, Netflix's, you know, sister program, Peacock or whatever is like a Vince McMahon, you know, direct to DVD action flick, you know, where Vince McMahon plays Liam Neeson role and take in part seven, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. See Vince do that kind of stuff. I don't know if Vince is going to be a movie star as his face isn't looking so great anymore. <laughs> I think Vince had some work done and he has aged dramatically over the last several years, but, uh, so I think with Brian James coming in and with Jeff going out, there's a lot of changes happening up at the top. But there's other changes that are happening in the world of the WWE and under that umbrella, Scott. One of those things is there has been mass releases from NXT UK this past week. So NXT Europe is something that has been announced and is coming to fruition. And with that, they said NXT UK is going to be going on hiatus. And almost immediately, they when you say hiatus, I think, okay, they're taking a break. They're not going to record any NXT UK programs. Almost immediately started letting go of a lot of contracted talent. And then some of some select talent from NXT UK started arriving and showing up on NXT Prime's television show, NXT 2.0. And they've already set up for the next NXT premium live event, which is When Worlds Collide for there to be some unification matches between the women's champion uh, and then as well as the NXT champion, Braun Breaker, and the NXT UK champion, um, Tyler Bate. So that's going to be taking place at when when worlds collide. I'm kind of shocked that they're going to go to this level of kind of unifying these championships, but I think there are some pros and some cons to it. So who, who knows what NXT... Europe is going to look like, but I assume they're going to implement some of those other other things, other countries like uh, Germany and whatnot. Germany has a really good thing going on. Uh, there's lots of those. China had a good thing. And at one point, they were talking about having various, various different uh, NXT factions out there by having like 
NXT Japan. That was something at one point they were talking about buying some small Japanese companies and having NXT Japan. Uh, they were talking about uh, having NXT Germany and all this. So I think this is kind of a conglomeration of all of that. NXT Europe. And then if they had a unified champion, similar to how WWE has Roman Reigns as the top guy, it allows one central figurehead champion to be able to go all over the place. And I think that that makes the championship more important. I think that's a great thing. What do you think? I think I think anytime you can expand the wrestling base outside of your current area, being let's call it the North American f- footprint, if you can go into the UK, the, the China, the Indias, you know, anywhere else in the country, we are not the most populous country in the world. There are a lot more people and a lot of other places that can help make you money as a company. So if WWE wants to continue to grow, they're a big fish in a little pond in the United States. They want to become a big fish in every pond throughout the world. And by all means, more power to them because there are a lot of good wrestlers out there that we have never heard of, never seen. And for us, in order to see them, it's going to take a WWE to put them on our TV sets. So good move. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm kind of excited. Like, I, I got to be honest with you. Ever since I was a big fan of NXT's Black and Gold, like that whole from like 2014 up till 2021 big fan of everything that NXT did. It was like having WWE's own version of Ring of Honor, having a a feeder system, but at the same time, it really was a third touring brand. I mean, they were selling out arenas. It was, it was amazing uh, what was happening. And then unfortunately the pandemic and COVID really decimated that stuff. And then you couple in other X factors like Triple H's health, Triple H said that's kind of the route that they were going. The advent of AEW uh, coming up and them having the uh, the quote unquote Wednesday night wars. They didn't really have a choice. They had to move to Tuesdays uh, per their agreement with USA. There were other factors, um, but it really did make Vince sour on the idea of having that third brand, believing that they got their butts kicked and stuff like that. It was just a different presentation. And of course, every time that he turned around, he brought an NXT, you know, megastar up to, to Raw or SmackDown and completely changed everything that made them special or unique, took away aspects of their gimmicks, of their character, and then made it to where they weren't as valuable once they were on the main roster. Didn't, didn't, uh, didn't they bring up a, a superstar from NXT last year about this time and changed everything about him? I mean, he was an NXT <laughs> champion, changed everything about him, and in December said, you know what? He's not working. Let's get rid of him. Whatever happened to him? Yeah, so that's unfortunate. I don't know what the idea was that Vince had, but Vince took Karrion Cross, who paired with Scarlett, was this unique special package that had been presented in NXT. He he had been the NXT champion two times. Uh, Ended up just, I mean, man, he was so incredible in everything that he did with that character. And he got brought up. He loses in three minutes to Jeff Hardy in his debut, which is not the way you really want to debut somebody like that that can be a main eventer. He comes up, loses the way that he did in that fashion, Uh, was immediately tarnished. And it didn't make sense. Why do you take this guy who can be a main event guy and just make him look like just one of the talents, you know? So uh, then they ended up putting this this goofy gimmick where he had this red leather demolition S&M, you know, outfit on that just totally changed his presentation. And he had a dumb helmet that, you know, like some kind of Starshooper (laughs) helmet or something. And it was like, okay, I get the idea you're trying to go for this warrior look, you know, and not not to be confused with the ultimate warrior, but to go for this, like, you know, combatant, this fighter. But it was like, man, you're just, you're messing with something that's already great the way that it is. And so when when Triple H brought him back, he brought him back the right way. And he mm-hmm. brought him back. You want to make somebody a top guy, you bring him back on top. And immediately started rubbing elbows with Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre. That's well, literally one of the best debuts, uh, re-debuts I've ever seen. 
by having him come back and take somebody who is as over as Drew and smashing his head into the steel po- uh, steps the way that he did, it was like, oh, you know, this guy's a player. Yep. And then Scarlet placing the uh, the sands of time, you know, uh, thing on the apron and then cross pointing to it like, uh, you know, time's almost up for you, Roman. It's like, holy crap. This guy's being brought in right on the top. And it's like, that's Triple H yep. doing exactly what we were hoping that he would do is presenting top stars like they're top stars. Now, didn't he, just, how to create- didn't he just do that again this past Monday night with someone? <laughs> he did. He did. As a matter of fact, Johnny Gargano, also known as Johnny Wrestling, returned to WWE on Monday Night Raw. And wow, I got to tell you, half of the crowd knew who he was, half of the crowd didn't. But for the half that knew him, they came out of their seats for him. There, there's been a lot of talk about Johnny and where he was going to end up. He's His contract ended not long ago with the birth of his daughter. Of course, his wife, Candice LeRae, also was an NXT superstar. And she also is not under contract with the company. But at this point, it was like, where's he going to go? Uh, AEW was rumored heavily to be working hard to get Johnny uh, Gargano under contract with them. And in fact, they have a show coming up in Cleveland and that's where he's from, Cleveland, Ohio. And a lot of people believed that's where AEW is going to debut Johnny Gargano. And instead, uh, Shawn Michaels reached out to him. That was his job was to work on getting Gargano back into the WWE fold. And apparently he did just that as he came out and he came in right on top too. Just like you're saying, he came in, Scott, and uh, and he mixed it up right away with Austin Theory. Now Theory and he had some uh, some member uh, they had some shared memories together in NXT, and uh, eventually Gargano super kicked him in the mouth, so immediately positioning him right up there at the top. He's a smaller guy, but he's one of those guys like Shawn Michaels that's this incredible underdog, and you just want to see him win. You know? No doubt. Now, the thing that I liked that they did with Gargano, along with Cross, was they come out and their very first image, their very first time in the ring after a while is, I want to be a champion. I am not here to wrestle in the middle or the bottom. I want to be the U.S. champion. I want to be the Intercontinental champion. I want to be every single, I want to hold every belt at some point in this company. And that's how you present someone. That's how you bring them out. Does anyone want to go into a new job and go, yeah, I just want to be the guy that pushes paper around? Or do you want to go in and say, I want to be the boss. I want to be the one in charge. I want to be the one writing the checks. I want to be the one that everyone looks up to and answers to. That's what you want in a wrestler, and that's how it should be promoted. And guess who is doing it now? It is Triple H. And I'm sorry if I'm getting excited right now, but no, I'm, it's, I it, am pumped There's so much up. to be excited about. <laughs> there's a lot to be excited about. No, it, and the other thing is too. I think even more important when he when he talked about those titles, when he talked about those championships, he's putting emphasis on how important they are, and that's what Triple H has been doing with these video packages talking about the history of the United States Championship, the history of the Intercontinental Championship, and putting those up towards the the top of the card and really, really making those more a focal point of the TV instead of it being, uh, it's just a mid-card title. We just, we got to give a championship to the the mid-card guys who aren't doing anything. I think that honestly, the way that they're doing it is exactly the way you and I kind of laid it out uh, in the past, we talked about one champion, one heavyweight world champion, and then having those secondary titles put more emphasis on them, make them more important, make them the focal point of the weekly television where you're looking forward to Bobby Lashley coming in and defending that U.S. title or people gunning for that U.S. championship. And then, hey, I'm going to use this. Eventually, I'm going to try to become the world champion. But the U.S. title is a lofty goal, and it puts me in contention for for the big championship belt. And same thing on the other side with Gunter and the Intercontinental Championship. There's so much history there. And the way that they've been presented as of late, those two champions and those championships specifically has been fantastic. And Johnny coming back and then immediately saying, I've always wanted to be, I can't be away from here and ever be the U.S. champion. 
I can never be the Intercontinental Champion if I don't come back. I can never be the WWE Champion if I don't come back. You know, so it, it's he's putting an emphasis on that is a goal for me. And you're right. It, it lets people know that's his goal. And it lets people know that's a, that's a lofty goal for anybody who's a pro wrestler. Those are the things that they want to attain is making those championships special. So it, hats off to you, Triple H. Oh. Hats off to you, uh, Shawn Michaels, for being able to get Johnny coming back. Um, I think this is a huge win. I think that Johnny would have just went over to AEW and AEW is so bloated at the moment with talent in a way that WWE isn't. AEW is bloated, overwhelmed with all this great talent. And I just feel like they don't have enough television to be able to produce all of that talent. So there's a lot of unhappy people working for AEW right now that aren't quite being used the way they'd like to be used. There's not enough TV time. So people are relegated to a whole lot of uh, AEW Dark and AEW Elevation, which are the 30 minute YouTube shows that are, you know, just kind of not produced as well. Uh, Rampage is not doing well either. Uh, it's being taped a lot of times after Dynamite. Dynamite's a hot show. So then after a, a long show, then they're coming out and doing Rampage and the crowd is burnt out. And you're seeing that, that the crowd is lessened with their excitement and their enthusiasm. They're exhausted. <laughs> after all of the dark and elevation and everything, and then dynamite, and then coming forward to do Rampage, the crowd is exhausted. They don't have as much energy. Of course, they'll still pop for some of the bigger things or, or the bigger stars, but you're seeing that reflected right now in a lot of the ratings, Scott. The ratings are really low on Fridays for Rampage. I think they were a little over 300,000, 320,000 this last Friday night. So, They've got some shaping up to do as far as how their stuff is presented. They may have to maybe go to Daly's place on Fridays and start doing doing it live. Mm -hmm. And I know that costs more money. It does cost more money to produce a live show. But that crowd, AEW's fan base has been fantastic. That crowd is so important to how the, how the company is run and how they're uh, perceived. And when you are putting them out there on television and the crowd is just exhausted and they're just not quite all there for a CM Punk coming out and talking, um, you know, you got to change some stuff up. So well, uh, if they use Daly's Place as a regular Friday night live event, they've got a built in audience because they will continue to come. It's and the place is not designed to make money on the audience or the ticket sales. They could almost yeah. give those tickets away to the diehards and do fine. If you've got it set up for audio, lighting, and the the t camera, then your costs are cut right there. Just leave it set up week in and week out. The The only cost you're going to have is production costs, people, people in production. And yeah. so you've cut your cost in half. You have a great live crowd again. It's only an hour. So, and you're right, AEW is... They're wrestler heavy TV light. And I understand. Well, <laughs> I understand why they're doing it because they want to build a library. They need the talent to build a library. They want to add more TV time. So they're negotiating for more TV time. So they need the wrestlers. But when, when AEW started, the wrestlers considered WWE the penalty box, the prison. They couldn't get out. They were mm. stuck and they wanted to go where the grass was greener. Now, with Triple H back, you are actually hearing AEW wrestlers saying they're stuck in the penalty box, they're stuck in the AEW prison, and they want to go back to WWE because it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah, so there's a few that are very upset oh. that they left and say, and like there's a couple that have been reported. You know, we can't say with any real certainty, but reported there's a couple of stars at AEW right now who have said that have left WWE recently that are saying, if I only would have known that Triple H would be, I could have held out and waited and like they want to get out of their contracts at AEW because they know and realize that they would be presented much differently than how they were under the Vince McMahon creative regime. Mm -hmm. So uh, one other thing we got to, we got to touch on Scott. I mean, there's a, there's two more articles that we've got that I feel like we really need to discuss. And uh, real quick, speaking about, you know, being heavy with talent, one major talent returned uh, to AEW. And I think <laughs> this guy may be a game changer 
I know that uh, you call him the best damn bout machine, and I'm talking about Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega returned uh, to AEW in the trios tournament alongside the Young Bucks, uh, and they advanced in the trios tournament for the trios championship. And uh, I gotta tell you, man, this guy is the guy, man. I I realize I'm a huge fan of Punk. I, I like John Moxley. I, I like what he's doing. Not a big fan of some of his stuff, but. I see somebody like Kenny Omega as being, that's the guy you want to continually have up there at that top of the car. You can plug him in when you need him because it's not about just his wrestling stuff. It's just his presentation. He's different. And I think that that guy is a main eventer and he's different than anything else on WWE TV. And I think that's a good thing. Be different. You don't want to be WWE light. You want to be totally a different entity and be the alternative to what they offer on USA and Fox, you know? When Kenny Omega was in New Japan, I was a massive fan. I I loved Kenny Omega because he was doing stuff as he was standing in the ring and you knew you were looking at a superstar. Just his presence alone, you knew he was a superstar. So when he came to AEW, I was so excited because I was going to be able to see him every week on TV without having to try and find a New Japan program. So... Kenny Omega was, he left last November, 10 months ago for surgery to, to treat with or treat a bunch of different ailments, shoulder, groin. I mean, he had a bunch of stuff wrong that he'd been working through. So he's been out for 10 months. They didn't even know for sure if he was going to be able to return because his therapy wasn't going as well as he had hoped at times, which therapy is never fun. There's a reason they call PT physical torture. Trust me. And so, but no, he, it was rumored that he was going to show up with the Bucks Wednesday night. And he did. Kenny Omega is back. And even at the reduced capacity that he appeared to be wrestling at, he still looked like a star. Yes, he had on the black uh, compression shirt that looked like it was puffed up with muscles underneath it. <laughs> little, little, uh, you know, paint some abs on. Maybe not in the 100% best shape that he used to be in, but he's been in re rehab with therapy. His move set was not as crisp and perfect as it used to be. Once again, he's been out 10 months. You not do something for 10 months and then try to do it with others who have been doing it every day for the last 10 months, you're not going to look as good anyway. Yeah, you're so, going to be off a step. Yeah, <laughs> he he missed some moves. He missed some spots. He... He, he was operating what looked to be at about 50%. And it looked like he was favoring his shoulder. Whether he was or not, you know, whether it was a work, I don't know. But Kenny Omega has never been the best actor in the world. <laughs> so I'm thinking that his shoulder still does bother him. But it was yeah. good to see him back. I, and I think that him coming back not 100% looking as far as in the ring, there is going to be that, that ring rust. I don't think it would have been a great thing for him to show up and be at 100% going. You know what I mean? I think he's got to warm up a little bit. And then it shows that ring rust actually tells a better story in the long run. So I'm excited about him being back. We, I'm sure, in my opinion, that, that they're headed right for the trios championship in the final, more than likely. I think that the titles were kind of built with them in mind. Um, so we'll wait to be seen. Uh, the thing is, they've got a lot of six man teams, a lot of three, three man teams uh, to do these trios titles. And I think that they've been doing this way before with a lot of these you know, three person clicks. I think it's going to be a very good thing to have this championship. It's just again, it comes down to how many six man matches can you have on television and do you have enough television to feature them? But I think that the Bucks and Kenny together is going to be a good a good piece of AEW exclusive content that only they can provide. And I think they do make a good <coughs> team together. Uh, there's one other one other news article that we can talk about or item that we can talk about. And uh, it also comes from AEW. The world of AEW is producing a lot of stuff this week. And one of those things is CM Punk returning and then having this insane um, promo where he kind of blast 
Adam Page, as well as John Moxley, setting up an eventual unification with Moxley. Now, I know you followed this stuff a little closer. I wasn't aware, Scott and I were talking, uh, uh, full disclosure, we were talking before the show about some of these articles, and I wasn't aware that Page, Adam Page, the hangman, had actually kind of thrown some shade that was maybe a little, a little hot at uh, CM Punk when they were building their thing up for their championship match last May. So, Scott, if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on some of the stuff that went down between these two guys. Well, let's begin with the most recent CM Punk promo Wednesday night. He, he came out and went into business for himself and called out Adam Page. Well, Adam Page was in the building, but it was not scheduled for him to do anything like come to the ring or say anything. CM Punk knew that. So CM Punk calls him out. Nothing happens. CM Punk says a few things disparagingly against Adam Page for no reason for a championship match. And then proceeds to say, that's not cowboy shit. That's chicken shit. And then he moves on to John Moxley, where he was supposed to begin. Well, he, <laughs> CM Punk has been taking a lot of heat from other wrestlers and fans for his proposed supposed burying of Adam Page. Well, let me give you some history. I don't agree with the fact that CM Punk took any heat. He shouldn't, because when you look back in time, back in uh, April, May, June, when they were promoting the championship match that CM Punk ended up winning, Hangman Page, in his promos, if you were to go back and watch them with this in your rearview mirror, knowing what they're talking about, there's a lot of insider stabs towards CM Punk that Hangman was making. And he he basically, if you were to go back and watch him, he told CM Punk, you know, I don't need to listen to the veteran wrestlers because I know what I'm doing and I know just as much, if not more than you, how to deal with the current generation of fans. I came into this company with my best friends Kenny Omega, the the Young Bloods, you know, or the you know what I mean. Anyway, and Cody, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and Cody, and the Young Bucks, not Bloods. And he's like, they're my best friends. We started this company. You're just a WWE guy. They brought in to you know bump up the ratings, and that was one of the things that CM Punk said in his promo was that he is there to make money for the company and ratings, whereas Hangman's not. So I suggest that people go back and watch Hangman's promos leading up to that match. One of the things that at the time people were saying that are in the know, in the business, some of the people we talked to, was they were surprised that CM Punk did not make Tony Khan take the title off of Hangman for whatever reason and put it on someone else for CM Punk to beat because they didn't even know if Hangman was going to do the business like he was supposed to based on the promos that he was giving. CM Punk held back, did not take it out on Hangman at the time, but evidently this time off, there's been something happening behind the scenes that set Punk off and he buried Hangman Wednesday night and Hangman did not get a chance to do or the say anything. <laughs> yeah. And if, if I was, if I was Hangman, I would have walked out the aisle or the tunnel, given the old Steve Austin two finger salute to CM Punk, just to let people know that I'm there. I see you and I don't really give an F about you because you're not important to me and walk back. But instead he no showed the tunnel because he wasn't supposed to be there and he just looks bad and CM Punk is taking heat for it. And I don't think he should. Yeah. I, well, it sounds like it was a receipt. Uh, he did get a whole lot of heat. He, he was uh, pretty stiff in some of those comments that he made. Of course, he set up the stuff with John Moxley, but uh, I don't know, man, wrestling is, is at an all time high right now. And I'm thankful that each and every week there's constantly something to talk about. Because it doesn't seem like there's been one week, Scott, since we started the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast where there isn't something crazy going on. I mean, wrestling is just at that level right now, and it's peaking in popularity, and I'm excited to see what the future holds 
for every company, for WWE, AEW included. So this week, we actually are doing, in our main event, we're doing a WrestleMania Rewind. Both Scott and myself went back and watched the first, the inaugural WrestleMania. And uh, I got to tell you, it was headlined by Hulk Hogan and Mr. T against Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. There was so much to be said about this card, Scott. We're not going to go... Um, too much in depth. We all kind of know this thing, but I'll tell you what, looking from this perspective, years, years past. Um, wow. I I'm just blown away by the spectacle of the first WrestleMania and how Vince gambled everything to be able to, to build his company. If it would have failed, he would have lost everything. He, he had actually had control of Georgia championship wrestling sold to Jim Crockett. Uh, sold to Jim Crockett and Crockett paid him a million dollars. And it's reported that at that time, that money is what paid for the first WrestleMania. And so, man, if he would have lost out, it would have been absolutely bad for business. And thankfully he didn't. WrestleMania ended up helping WWE to just catapult into a stratosphere. And now each and every year, it is the Super Bowl of wrestling. It's the thing we look forward to. Of course, now it's two nights a, a year, Scott. Uh, maybe a, maybe some would say a little too much wrestling uh, in, a, in a two night event like that. But this first one had a lot of matches. The first match right out the gate, Tito Santana against the Executioner. Of course, Buddy Rose was under the hood. And um, I don't know if you remember Buddy Rose as Playboy Buddy Rose in 89, 90, Scott. This is the same guy who had a little, he was a jobber in WWE at this point. He had gained quite a bit of weight. He was like 320 pounds and he would always claim that he was 216 pounds. And uh, he had the blow away diet at one point that was all over WWE television where he would cover this powder all over his heavy body and then sit in front of a fan and allow the dust to get blown off of his body. And he'd say, it's the blow away diet, you know, and, it, and actually really entertaining. I mean, here it is 30 years later and I'm still talking about it. You know, it's still memorable as one of those goofy WWE, WWF at the time gimmicks. But yeah, he was under the hood and Tito won with a uh, a figure four, which he was feuding with the Intercontinental Champion Greg Valentine at the time. And this was a direct slam towards Valentine because he was the Intercontinental Champion and that was his finish, was the figure four. Do you have any comments on this match, that opener? Uh, I, uh, I, I do, but <clears throat> excuse me, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm suffering from a cold, if you can't tell, but... I, before I get into this match, I just want everyone to know that this was 1985. This was, we're almost 20, or I'm sorry, yeah, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Good God, I can't even count yeah, anymore. 40 years ago. <laughs> Good God, just slap me up alongside the head and bury me now. But 1985. So to watch this match, or to watch the entire program, I had to dust off my old black and white television and crank up the thing on the side to get the juice flowing through it. And keep in mind, like, like JJ said, if this did not work, we may not have a WWE at this time. And attendance, now, now keep in mind, 1985, standing room only at Madison Square Garden! A robust 19,121 people paid gate. That is small potatoes now. That's nothing. But not only that, the real money is made from the pay-per-view. In 1985, they didn't really have what we would call now a pay-per-view. You couldn't sit at home and pay to watch it. They had what was called and most of you won't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Closed circuit television. That means that you had to go somewhere that paid to show it on their, their screen, like your local movie theater. They would charge you to come into the movie theater to watch it. Or a bar. It was closed circuit. And you had to they pay also, to get to the bar. Yeah, they also did it at, at other arenas, which is just crazy to me that other arenas would have you know, four or 5,000 people show up to sit and watch a, a big screen watching WrestleMania. And that's the way that a lot of those events were done back then was by that closed circuit. And of course, it was the next event after WrestleMania one, 
uh, the Wrestling Classic, which was a tournament. And that was the first one that actually implemented pay-per-view for the very first time. Of course, now we know those as just premium live events. You can mm -hmm. get them on traditional pay-per-view, but with the Peacock Network, they're just you know free for the subscription. Yeah. You can just watch them each month. Um, so it's just, wow, that we've come so far uh, in such a, uh, really, it's a short time. 40 years is not that long of a time for things to be changed so much over the years in the way that that uh, we get our content. Closed circuit, I, I've i never done so myself. I'm a little bit younger. I do remember pay-per-view, obviously, many, many, many times getting the pay-per-view events, but I never went to any events. Of course, last week we had Buddy Satello was here, my, my friend from the professional wrestling business, a former manager, and uh, he actually went to WrestleMania two, which was held the next year in 1986. Uh, he went to the L.A., uh, complex and ended up watching that version, which of course had King Kong Bundy and Hulk Hogan in the main event in the steel cage. And he was there in the crowd while they're doing it. And that was on pay-per-view. That was the first WrestleMania that was on pay-per-view. There's a lot of matches that we could talk about. Um, and we can go through a lot of that kind of stuff. We're kind of short on time. We don't want to drag things out too terribly much, but some of the things that happened that are super mem uh, memorable of this event was the nine second loss, uh, King Kong Bundy defeated SD Jones, who was a jobber at the time, who was an enhancement talent that helped others to look better. The match actually take, took about 30 seconds, 25 seconds or something. <laughs> um, but they said it happened in nine seconds and it was a spectacle. And that's really what a lot of this event came down. The wrestling matches themselves weren't phenomenal. Matt Bourne and Ricky Steamboat had a fairly decent match, uh, which I couldn't remember Ricky Steamboat being at the first WrestleMania. But yeah, he and Matt Bourne had a match there. And uh, there was other stuff. Leilani Kai uh, and Wendy Richter, the women's championship was on the line. Of course, Cindy Lauper was there in attendance and was seconding Wendy Richter. This, of course, was the whole boom of rock and wrestling. The thing that WrestleMania won and Vince did with the rock and wrestling thing that was so good was that they implemented some of these celebrities that were known outside of the world in, in rock and roll, Cindy Lauper and the like, and, and use them really well. He used a celebrity of Mr. T who at the time you have to realize that Mr. T was, and we'll just, we'll end at this with talking about the main event. Hogan and Mr. T were in this tag match against, uh, and they had Jimmy Snuka in their corner, who was a big star at the time going against Rowdy Roddy Piper, the biggest heel in the business along with Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and then Cowboy Bob Ace Orton in their corner. And Muhammad Ali was a special referee. Um, so he was on the outside. Pat Patterson was on the inside as referee. And the reason for that was Muhammad Ali, with his issues um, with Alzheimer's and stuff, was just not going to be able to be in the ring at the whole time. So he was used at the last moment to do that celebrity rub and this was a this is a big deal. Of course, Liberace was there and he was a, a very big character act at the time in music. And so they used them so well to just compliment what it was. Hopefully you come, you watch WrestleMania and then, you know, you're there for the celebrity and for the spectacle of it all. But then you hopefully fall in love with what this is, this this form of entertainment. And uh, Mr. T at the time, of course, we all know him from the Rocky movie um, where he was such a big star in Rocky three as Clubber Lang. But you also remember that at this time, Scott, he was on the number one television show, the A team. And I don't know about you, but I was a huge fan of the A team. Loved in it. The 80s. Loved it. Yeah, it was fantastic. And he was used so well. He, uh, he wasn't a real fighter, but people believed that about him because of that character, Mr. T that he created. And he just was such a huge star. And it didn't last. They they tried to use him again at like WrestleMania 2. And by that point, kind of the, the novelty had worn off and he wasn't as big a star as he was in 1985. But at that time, he was huge. A few days before WrestleMania 1, they were hosting Saturday Night Live with Billy Crystal and the like. Uh, so, I mean, that shows you how big they were at the time. And of course, it was at the same time getting ready for WrestleMania 1 that they were guest on Richard Belzer's show and Belzer was basically kind of joking and laughing at Hogan and calling it fake. And at this time they protected their business 
at all costs. They didn't want to say, look, it's just entertainment. You know, at that time, it, they tried to present it like it was real. And so he's being made fun of. So then he shows him a wrestling move. Hogan shows Meltzer or Beltzer. I almost said Meltzer. <laughs> Although I'm sure some people wanted to choke out Dave Meltzer sometimes. Uh, chokes out and knocks out cold Richard Belzer and then drops him on the concrete. And when he did, he split the back of his head open and he jumped up and said, we'll be right back after these messages. And he had a bad concussion. And of course, he ended up getting all kinds of money out of WWE. It took a few years. He was suing them, suing Hogan and WWE. And it took a few years for him to get all the money out of them. But he bought a house and he would tell people this is the house that Hulk Hogan paid for, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's pretty bad. But of course, we all know what happened. Uh, Roddy Piper says that people came to WrestleMania to see Hulk Hogan kick Roddy Piper's butt versus they just came to see Hulk Hogan. It was more about Roddy being that major bad guy. And man, there was nobody that could do heel work like Roddy Piper at the time. And WWE believed that he was too small. So they usually used him in a player coach role, which he was like the manager to Cowboy Bob Orton and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, who Vince saw as real stars. But Piper could talk. Piper was a slightly smaller dude. And of course, we all know that Hogan refused to lose the championship to Roddy Piper, which was unfortunate because I think that there was so much more there that they could have feuded over that championship had Piper have you know, stole it off of him or whatever, and then had Hogan chasing it. The chase is always so much more enjoyable that way. So looking back, I would say that WrestleMania was a huge success. I still look back on it fondly. I had fun with it. The wrestling matches, like I said, were not uh, all Ricky Steamboat, um, Ric Flair classics, but it was a spectacle. And I'm glad to refresh my memory of just what got us to the dance. Scott, do you have any lasting memories of the first WrestleMania having rewatched it again? I just remember when I was watching it, I, I had forgotten about Big John Studd and Andre oh, the Giant doing the body right. slam contest. I mean, just Big John Studd. I was like, hey, Big John Studd. Um, and I just, watching Rowdy Roddy Piper be a heel is a clinic. The man was the best. And seeing Liberace accompanied by the rocket, you know, the spectacle aspect of it was what made the show. And I'm just glad that it worked out. Cindy Lauper. I was a big Cindy Lauper fan at the time. It was part of that wrestling, rock and wrestling connection. And so, yeah, it was it was a spectacle. It was a show. I'm glad it worked out. And I forgot to mention oh. that the that body slam challenge, like just watching that again, I imagined myself being in the crowd there. And like, can you imagine Andre the Giant, you know, as big as he was, and of course they build him as seven foot four and 500 pounds or whatever, reaching in and grabbing that money and throwing some to the crowd. It was like, it's just, wow, what a hell of a spectacle. And who knows how much money he actually threw out then or whatever. And of course, Bobby Heenan runs back with the bag with the rest of it to save it. But uh, I can only imagine like the people there just had to have had a blast. I had a blast rewatching it. And uh, we look forward to covering more and future WrestleManias in the past. Next week here on the show, we've got a main event that Scott and I are excited to talk about. We're going to take one match from a WrestleMania, a classic that people have said possibly the greatest match in WrestleMania history. Is it technically? No. No, it's not technically, but it's one of those matches that has that spectacle to it, has that big match feel. And we're talking about WrestleMania 18's Rock versus Hollywood Hogan. And we'll talk about that next week here on the show. That's all we've got for you guys. We appreciate you joining us here on the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. Of course, we're produced each and every week by the Suplex, or by the Suplex. <laughs> we are the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast. We are produced each and every week by the Super Gamer Boys, uh, specifically Garrett Morlang, who makes us sound better. He always edits us out. All of the, the really severe cursing that Scott does each and every week, he edits it out and makes this a family-friendly show. And Garrett, we appreciate you for that. Thank you. If you want to reach out to me on Twitter, you can always find me at JJ Purdom. Scott, where can they find you? They can find me at Scott underscore Falder anytime. And you can also find both of us as well as the podcast at Suplex City Pod. If you have questions you'd like us to answer here on the show, comments, you want to reach out to us and just say, screw you guys, we hate your show or we love your show and we want to support you financially, please reach out to us at Suplex City Pod. 
For Scott Falder and myself, we are the Suplex City Wrestling Podcast, and we'll catch you down the road.